May raised some really, really wonderful points about the cultivation of alliances and the ways in which alliance politics, alliance building works and plays out across the Middle East. And what we're going to have in this, this coming session is a discussion about some of the uh, some of the features of Iranian politics and the way that Iran operates across the region um, and the, the arenas in which Iran operates. And I'm delighted that we have some wonderful scholars joining us today. Uh, I'll do introductions to each speaker just before their, their talk, but we have uh, Luciano Zakara, uh, Gulri Sen, Shukru Childa, and Olivia Glombitsa, who are all going to be talking about a range of different aspects pertaining to Iran and Iran in the region. And I, one, one quick point is to say that I'm, I'm sad that a couple of scholars who were supposed to be taking part on this panel from Iran were unable to do so um, due to a couple of, of issues. And we're very sad to, to miss out on that. It would have been great to have have some additional young early career scholars, scholars from the region. And that was one of the things that we really wanted to, to do with this, um, this e-conference. But I think it's been, it's been fascinating so far and I'm looking forward to another fantastic panel talking about Iran. So what we'll do is we will work through the, um, we'll work through the order from, from the program. And that means that uh, we have a paper from Luciano and Olivia. Um, Luciano is a, an academic based out at Qatar University. Olivia is a PhD student at the, uh, the Autonoma University in Barcelona. Uh, they're both affiliated with SEPAD and they're going to look at Iran's behavior in the, uh, in the Gulf region. So I don't know which one of you will be kicking us off but I will hand over to you. I'll ask you to keep an eye on your, on your chat where I'll give you a three minute heads up and then a one minute heads up. Um, but the floor is now yours. Splendid, Simon. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I'm going to kick uh, us off. Um, uh, a shout out, a quick shout out to, to the fellow panelists, uh, to our participants. Um, hello and and welcome to, to our session. Um, I, I note I'm a little tech impaired uh, presenting from my phone, but I will try to make my part of the presentation as jazzy as possible in order to keep uh, uh, you um, in order to keep your interest. Uh, Luciano and I are going to speak about our paper on um, Iran's initiatives of constructive engagement in the GCC countries through the lens of the Islamic Republic. The paper is an article in progress and it emanates from a research project on the role of ideational factors in foreign policy and their impact on peace building in the Middle East and the Gulf. With this approach, our paper aims at offering a different and alternative perspective on the Islamic Republic by contributing a comprehensive uh, study of Iran's initiatives of constructive engagement during Rouhani's presidency. And here we primarily focus on two initiatives by their acronyms, they're called WAVE and HOPE. WAVE meaning uh, World Against Violence uh, and Extremism and HOPE meaning Hormuz Peace Endeavor. The background to our study, and we heard a little bit about this already during May's presentation, if you had a chance to participate, uh, the background here uh, for us consists of the changes that uh, were triggered um, by the Islamic Republic in regards, uh, by the Islamic Revolution, pardon, in regards to regional and international order. Uh, because as is well known, the revolution had changed everything for Iran. Not only did it mean an overhaul of domestic politics, uh, but it also meant a fundamental change in Iran's place in the world and the region. Long-standing alliances um, were dissolved and amongst others, Iran lost its place um, and status as regional anchor for the United States. So transition, transitioning to, uh, to an Islamic Republic under the leadership of Iran's first supreme leader, Imam Khomeini, Iran developed its uh, official revolutionary ideology and means of foreign engagement. The changes perpetuated by the revolution further led to Iran's increasing isolation, 
regionally as well as internationally. And the Islamic Republic has since then sought to carve out its new role and place. In our paper, we argue that despite the often perceived rigidity uh, of its ideology and much anti-Western rhetoric, Iran's official revolutionary ideology is neither monolithic nor mon fundamentalist, but inherently pragmatic. And it is in line with Iran's overall foreign policy approach to realize its interests. Consequently, over the years, Iran has introduced a number of initiatives of constructive engagement to, to achieve its various goals. And those include, uh, amongst others, the normalization of relations with regional and international actors, the reintegration into the international community, the achievement of regional peace and stability, the overcoming of pressures of isolation and sanctions, the reduction of tensions and the acceptance as regional um, as important regional player. I need to break here for a second. Unfortunately, I have construction work in the building next to me since yesterday. Elias, could you give me, a, um, uh, could you tell me whether this is bothering? So I, I put on headphones. We can't hear anything. You're all Sounds good. clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Because it's quite loud for me. Good. So I said uh, the acceptance as an important regional player. So on one hand, we have these um, uh, these foreign policy goals, but also Iran is catering at the same time to domestic pressures and demands. Uh, however, while we believe that uh, ideology is not the only driver of foreign policy, we contend that the official revolutionary ideology sets a discursive frame and plays an important role uh, as a means of discursive persuasion. For our research, we, we utilized a, a range of primary and secondary resources, such as official discourses, agreements, um, and documents to study how these two initiatives, Wave and Hope, connect to Iran's official ideology, to its overall foreign policy approach, and thirdly, um, to prior initiatives. And in addition, we seek to illuminate um, how these uh, uh, initiatives objectives look like, what their domestic and international political context was uh, or is, and um, uh, the role of Iran's uh, ideology in its discursive appeals. So I just mentioned that um, we argue that Iran's ideology is neither monolithic nor fundamentalist, but inherently pragmatic. And indeed, the, the Islamic revolutionary ideology is a modern creation, incorporating the ideas of various uh, influential ideologues, and in which, on the one hand, derives legitimacy from um, Islamic texts and concepts, and on the other hand, incorporates modern uh, elements from, from different theories and movements, such as nationalism and socialism. And those ideas with the added revolutionary twists were woven into Iran's. Um, ideological fabric. The revolution and the Islamic Republic and of course also its ideology are inseparably intertwined as you will very well know um, with one man and this is Ruhollah Khomeini. His ideas and conceptions have heavily impacted on the Islamic Republic's worldview and ways of engagement and his articulations, principles and ideas have subsequently made their way into the Iranian constitution. This includes, for example, major tenets such as the struggle for sovereignty and against imperialism or foreign interference, as well as the pursuit of freedom, justice and independence. And in this context, the well-known historian Ervan Abrahamian has argued for the, Islamics, the Islamic Republic's ideology essentially being a form of Khomeinism. In his opinion, and I quote, Khomeinism should be seen as a flexible political movement expressing socio-economic grievances and not simply as a religious crusade obsessed with scriptural texts, uh, spiritual purity and theological dogma. So in sum, the, the flexibility and pragmatism were already part of Khomeini's uh, thinking and it is therefore not a recent phenomenon, but an inherent part of, of the ideology, although the portrayal very often looks otherwise. So along these lines, we can say that the Islamic Republic is neither following an exclusively ideological 
neither an exclusively um, pragmatic approach when it comes to its foreign relations, but both. And we can observe the flexibility of, of the Islamic Republic's ideology, ideology, particularly in instances when it is or was um, opportune to serve state interests. And in, in regards to its foreign policy priorities, those are very closely connected to, to Iran's domestic priorities. In other words, foreign policy is an important means to influence domestic politics. Uh, at the inception of Rouhani's presidency, uh, Iran's economy had been, and well, in fact, it, it is uh, still the case, badly affected by the aforementioned years of sanction and isolation. And also the relations with countries inside and outside of the region were perceptibly uh, tense when, when Rouhani uh, took, took over. So the government uh, was, was uh, under heavy pressure from the beginning and improving the economic situation and stabilizing the internal state of affairs was a primary objective for the new government. And the chosen path uh, to do so went through a change in Iran's foreign engagements in order to emerge from the ongoing decades of isolation to be able to re-enter the international financial system and to regain legitimacy on the international stage. Uh, and to this end, Iran, uh, Rouhani and his government built on dialogue and a much more pragmatic approach. And these two initiatives of the government that we are discussing in our article form part of these efforts. Uh, in line with, so the government does this um, in line with the constitution, but uh, I should mention it in stark contrast to uh, the um, the government of uh, Rouhani's neoconservative predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And um, the Rouhani and his government here, they place the fortunes on fostering the normalization of relations with countries in the region and also beyond. A few examples from, from how uh, the government is actually obliged to um, in, engage in the foreign relations. Um, they're supposed to develop foreign policy based on Islamic standards um, and they have brotherly obligations vis-a-vis -vis all Muslims and uh, should show an unqualified support for all the oppressed nations of the world. In an article uh, published in 2014 in, in Foreign Affairs, the Foreign Minister, Mohammad Javad Sarif, he lays out a couple of the principles of Iran's post-revolutionary foreign policy under the, the government of Rouhani. And these include a range of domestic objectives, such as the preservation of Iran's independence, territorial integrity, national security, and the achievement of long-term sustainable national development. But he also describes a set of foreign policy objectives, which include amongst others, the enhancement of Iran's regional and global stature, uh, to promote its ideals, including Islamic democracy, to expand its bilateral and multilateral relations, particularly with neighboring Muslim majority countries and non-aligned states, and to reduce tensions and manage disagreements with other states, to foster peace and security at both the regional and the international levels through positive engagement, and to promote international understanding through dialogue and cultural interaction. So with this, we can see here that apart from a focus on domestic politics, uh, Iran's neighbors and a peaceful, stable and secure region are among um, its main concerns. Consequently, while pursuing its aims regarding the normalization of relations with Western countries, the normalization of relations with regional states is more than important to Iran and it therefore exercises what the foreign minister calls constructive interaction. So quickly, over to, to Luciano. <laughs> we don't have any time, I can. Okay, so I assume that I have to, I have to rush now, no? Uh, well, following what uh, Olivia said and within this framework she, she pictured, and despite the long-term controversies and the competition for regional leadership with other Gulf states, 
uh, we argued that Iran gave the, G the six GCC states a priority treatment within its foreign policy design and strategies. And therefore, uh, the six monarchies have been at the core of the engagement initiatives that Iran proposed, uh, not only during Rouhani presidency, but even uh, before. The, the most important present we, we discuss in our paper, I'm not going to enter into detail, is a dialogue among civilizations initiative uh, proposed by the Iranian president um, Hatami in 1997. Uh, in the, it was introduced for the first time at the 8th Islamic Summit in Tehran. Uh, and the first goal of this uh, initiative was cultural discussion and promotion of different visions of the world to eliminate intolerance and intercultural and uh, religious uh, violence. Uh, there was no political or security agenda within this uh, initiative uh, and the initiative was later on presented at the United Nations General Assembly in 1998 and the 2001 was declared the year of the international, uh, the international year of the dialogue among civilization. Um, despite the good global reception the initiative had in the, in the in the General Assembly. Uh, it can be argued that the main Iranian objective was to mend ties with the immediate surrounding states, mainly the GCC neighbors. Proof of it was the rapprochement that Iran uh, had with Saudi Arabia during the summit, uh, with the visit of uh, Prince Abdallah uh, to Tehran uh, during the summit, and the relatively good relations that all GCC states had with Iran during uh, Hatami's both uh, terms. In terms of security arrangement, if we focus more on that side, Iran also suggested um, since the times of uh, President Rafanjani, uh, the creation of a comprehensive security framework within the Persian Gulf that guarantees the safety of the eight Gulf states, including the six GCC, Iran and Iraq, but with the prerequisite of ousting all the non-regional forces, namely the United States, from the Gulf. The same initiative had been presented by successive um, presidencies, uh, Ahmadinejad, I mean, Hatami, Ahmadinejad, uh, and, uh, and Rouhani, but without having a clear success until now. We can discuss why they were not successful. Uh, during President uh, Hassani, Hassan Rouhani's uh, terms, there were two main uh, diplomatic initiatives, as uh, Olivia mentioned, uh, tending to normalize Iran relations with the rest of the world after the controversial presidency of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and in the midst of the Arab uprisings, revolts that affected the whole uh, MENA region and also, and also the GCC. The first one, as she mentioned, it was called WAVE, uh, was uh, an international conference aimed at tackling the effects of radicalization of, and violence resulting from the regional conflicts in the MENA region and like the dialogue among civilizations, the initiative was presented at the United Nations General Assembly in December 2013 and it was adopted by the, by, by the, the Assembly. Uh, the conference was held in Tehran in December 2014. And there are many things that were written about that and also a revised version of WAVE was adopted then by the United Nations General Assembly again in December 2015 despite the, crit the heavy criticism coming from Canada, United States uh, and Israel. The draft of this uh, uh, proposal was finally approved in December 2017 by the same uh, General Assembly. Like the dialogue am among civilizations, the WAVE initiative was uh, aimed at reducing the tension within the MENA region, mainly in the Persian Gulf, despite the fact that uh, the objective was getting worldwide support so meaning that uh, normalization is behind the, the, the idea of um, getting the broad international support of this uh, initiative, regardless of the US uh, rejection of uh, the Iranian initiative. But the second and the most important uh, of the Rouhani's initiatives in foreign policy was the HOPE or Hormuz Peace Endeavour initiative, presented again at the United Nations General Assembly in November 2019. This initiative came in the midst of uh, an increasing tension between both Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iran and the US after Trump withdrawal from the JCPOA, the nuclear deal in May 2019. And uh, they escalated after several attacks that took place in the Persian Gulf water against GCC interests, mainly uh, Saudi and Emirati interests. 
the originality of this whole initiative compared with the other ones that we, we discussed in, in the paper is that for the first time a security arrangement proposed by Iran to the GCC neighbors did not exclude, at least in principle, the U.S. presence to present the state security. Uh, then, of course, the, 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 the agreement has nuances, and of course, uh, at the end of the day, Iran would uh, prefer the United States not to be included. But, um, uh, but this was, in principle, what the Sarif presented in November in uh, in, in New York, and later on in the conference in and uh, was repeated again in the conference uh, Tehran dialogue in January uh, 2020. Uh, however, there were some things that they, we, we had the chance to discuss with some Iranian officials that there was, there was no one specific definition of what is non-interference or how are internal affairs differentiated from other affairs. But the, the, the core of the initiative was sent to all the GCC states only three of them replied, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar. And Iran considered the lack of response from the other three GC states, Saudi, UAE, and Bahrain, as a constructive silence, although, again, it was not very clear what, does, what this is supposed to mean. The first conference of the HOPE uh, took place, as I said, on 6 January 2020, with the presence of the money foreign minister and high-ranking officials from Kuwait and Qatar as well. But the killing of, of Soleimani, a couple of days earlier, uh, arguably changed the planned uh, discourses from Sarif and other uh, members or other officials of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that were supposed to present the concrete steps of the initiative. This did not happen. I mean, most of the discourses were targeting the United States, uh, but it was possible to also to, to, to hear again the same uh, proposal, the same initiative in which at the beginning, there was not requested the full withdrawal of uh, United uh, States troops from the region if that was a guarantee for the for the security of the GCC states. To conclude, because I need to to to, to rush, although this is a working process as uh, a working progress as um, Olivia said, but we can share some preliminary conclusions that we we expect to demonstrate in the final version of our our paper. First, I mean, I will mention this in a bullet uh, point. Uh, pragmatism and ideology have been always present in Iranian foreign policy, and they were not in contradiction with Iranian foreign policy principles coined since the beginning of the Islamic Revolution. There is no contradiction on that. The initiatives discussed along the, the paper are in line with both the foreign policy uh, long-term objectives and the combination of these pragmatic and ideological elements that conform the Iranian foreign policy. Uh, then we have two things that we need, we want to demonstrate that, that that is when the internal and regional contexts were more favorable. Ideational, ideational elements, ideological elements were more present in the Iranian proposals, and when the internal and regional contexts were not favorable, uh, pragmatic elements were present, and ideational, ideational elements were absent. And this can be perfectly. Uh, uh, demonstrated comparing WAVE and, um, and HOPE initiative that they were different in principle and the, the scope of the initiative and the kind of agreement that was suggested by Iran. Uh, and finally, um, there is a consistency and in and congruence between discourse and action in Iranian foreign policy. These are the main elements we want to, 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 to demonstrate in our paper. As I said, this is a work in progress. We, we hope we, we can have the final draft for, for the paper so we, we can discuss more thoroughly uh, with, with you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luciano and Olivia. Really interesting stuff. Um, next up, we have Shukru Childa. So, Luciano, if I could ask you to switch off, thank you. Uh, and if I can ask the two of you to, to mute yourselves just to prevent any drilling noises that started to creep in towards the end, Olivia, that would be uh, that would be very kind. So next up, we have Shukru Childa. Very proud to say that Shukru is, is one of my PhD students. Uh, he's working on the role of oil within the context of a rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And he's a recent contributor to a, a SEPAD report looking at de-escalation in the rivalry between the two states. And so Shukru is going to be talking today about 
that space, that that role, uh, that that arena, that um, role that oil plays in the context of this this rivalry between the two states. So Shukru, I will remind you. Please keep an eye on the chat box. I will give you a three minute warning and a one minute warning. And I'll just quickly remind everyone that if they want to take part in, in the discussions, you can do so in the chat box. You can post your questions in the Q&A box, or you can join in the discussion on, the, um, on Twitter. And if you want to take part in Twitter, you can use the hashtag multipolar MENA. Okay, that's multipolar MENA, all one word, MENA, all caps. Okay, Shukru, over to you. The time right. is yours, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Simon. And also really huge thanks for our SEPAC team uh, who organized uh, this event uh, today for us. Just, I wanna uh, share my screen with my PowerPoint. And, okay. And are you hearing me? Yes, we are. We can hear you. All right. Okay. Okay. And thanks again. Uh, and hi, everyone. And uh, today I, I want to talk about the role of oil and the US in Saudi Iranian rivalry. And in my presentation, I will mainly uh, argue that the US led international system has provided an inter international space for utilizing oil as a detrimental tool in Saudi Iranian rivalry in the post-2003. And my presentation uh, will be consisted of three parts. In the first part, I will talk about the nature of international system, and then I will move to uh, how US structural power has been constructed in international system. And then finally, I will try to explain the question of how, do the, U how, how the US and oil affected uh, Saudi Iranian rivalry. Looking at the most of the IR studies, uh, it is uh, it can uh, it's largely assumed that all states uh, and other international actors conduct their relations within the international system, uh, which constitute constitute an international uh, context for their choices, uh, their preferences, and constrain their uh, actions. Uh, but their uh, understanding of international system are quite different. And uh, my understanding of international system is uh, quite in line with the uh, understanding of the uh, British School of IR. And accordingly, uh, I'm regarding uh, international system uh, as a structure uh, brought about uh, when two or more states have sufficient conduct and have sufficient impact on one another's decision, as stated by Hadley Wolf. And so, uh, the existence of states and their interactions and impact over one another's decisions are key to mention about the presence of international system. And therefore, uh, whether uh, they are developing or developed, or whether uh, they are Eastern or Western, all states are part of the international system, but the crucial point is that whether they are, uh, they are integrated to the system or isolated within the system. And current international system uh, has been largely shaped by the US uh, since the end of the World War II. And according to Susan Strange, uh, the US uh, influence over the system is quite related with its uh, structural power. And she argues that uh, U.S. Uh, has a dominance over the uh, over the four major uh, four major uh, global uh, structures, uh, namely production, security, uh, finance, and knowledge, and which is uh, quite uh, relevant in today's world as well. And when we uh, see these uh, tables, uh, we can uh, see that uh, to what extent uh, the U.S. has a structural power over the international system with it is, uh, its uh, highest uh, share in the global uh, GDP and uh, it is uh, unprecedented uh, military mind with its highest uh, military expenditure 
and other uh, economic and financial resources. And similarly, uh, such scholars like Simon Bromley, Dox Talks, and Sam Raphael, uh, they draw our attention to the fact that U.S. has an hegemonic position in the system and plays a managerial role over the system through which its allies benefit uh, from the emerging gains in the system, uh, but its rivals and enemies are deprived of uh, emerging political and economic uh, benefits uh, within the system. Uh, and as we can see in the Iranian case that I will come later, and uh, when we come to the energy politics, uh, I can say that uh, oil has been a strategic energy com commodity since the mid of the 1960s, in a sense that uh, states' economy, security, uh, and even the people's everyday life uh, quite dependent on the consumption of uh, oil. If I took this graph from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy, uh, even though, yes, there are uh, some growing popularity of uh, renewable energy uh, for the world uh, energy consumption, but uh, oil still keeps its importance uh, uh, or uh, as, a, as a most important energy resource with its uh, uh, share around uh, by, by, by over 30%. And uh, so, uh, U.S. Uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a hegemon in the system and uh, ensures the free flow of oil to the international market, even though it doesn't need to import for its domestic consumption. To this end, uh, the U.S. is quite eager to opening up the energy-rich economies of the developing world uh, to the international market, either through the consent or uh, through the uh, coercive measures. Given the impact of uh, this structural power over the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, it can be said that U.S. structural power or hegemony, whatever it's called, over the system constitutes an international, an international space which has been quite advantageous for Saudi Arabia, but quite unfavorable for uh, Iran, particularly since the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Since then, Iran had to deal with severe international isolations that would uh, cripple its petroleum industry, which was the heart of the Iranian economy at that time. And particularly when we come to the uh, post-2003, uh, when the Saudi-Iranian rival began to soar, due to the revitalizing Iranian nuclear program and rising sectarian conflicts in the region, oil began to be regarded as a detrimental tool for uh, Saudi-Iranian relations. But due to the rising demand for oil in the global market and skyrocketed oil prices, and the utilizing oil against Iran between 2003-2010 didn't work as much as uh, that in the post-2010. And when we come to the post-2010, uh, amidst the rising, uh, surging sectarian tensions in the region with Arab uprising and rising tensions of uh, Iranian nuclear program, a range of sanctions by the U.S. and EU were imposed against Iran in a way that its petroleum industry would be severely undermined. Although there, are, there might be a lot of concerns or opposition that can be uh, arose uh, on their compliance with the international law, particularly the sanctions, uh, unilateral sanctions adopted by the U.S. Uh, with the Trump administration by 2018. Uh, they are quite uh, domestic regulation of the uh, of the United States, and uh, from the perspective of international law, uh, no uh, countries, uh, no no country has to abide with uh, this uh, domestic regulation of uh, United States. But in reality, almost uh, and 
other all state, other states and their private firms had to abide by the U.S. sanctions, and which shows to what extent the U.S. structural power over the system is effective. Uh, but especially uh, supporting these sanctions by Saudi Arabia played an important role over the utilizing oil against Iran, and which uh, would later uh, deterior deteriorate uh, Saudi-Iranian relations and uh, scaled up their hostility. And to, cl uh, to clarify how the U.S. and oil increased Saudi-Iranian rivalry, I can put forward three factors. Uh, they are uh, financial and economic uh, constraints, replacing Iranian oil and militarizing the oil issue. And in the financial and economic constraints, uh, we can uh, see that the, in the post-2010, uh, Iran uh, experienced so many sanctions and it was uh, first started with the United Nations uh, sanctions with UN Security Council Resolution 1929, which was uh, focusing on arms embargo and prohibiting financial and shipping investment for uh, sensitive nuclear activities. US and EU sanctions uh, brought about a comprehensive ban on Iran's energy, trade, and financial sectors. And after that, uh, Iran began to uh, face a great deal of problems in, re in its receiving uh, uh, oil payments. And Iran's transaction with US dollar was substantially limited. And many international companies, such as Total, uh, of, uh, this is the uh, uh, French uh, company, uh, had to uh, either suspend or cancel their projects uh, to, to invest in Iranian energy sector. However, uh, who will, uh, uh, the, 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 another problem emerged here that who will uh, supply the lack of oil, uh, lack of Iranian oil in international uh, energy markets? And in this point, uh, United States and uh, Iran, uh, United States and Saudi Arabia played an important role. U.S. oil production reached to the 15 million barrels per day by 2018, which made the U.S. the most oil produced country in the world and also provided a great leverage uh, in international oil markets. And so uh, do, uh, the U.S. constituted an alternative destination for Iranian uh, customer, particularly the European uh, customer. In addition to that, uh, Saudi Arabia also supported these sanctions by increasing its oil. And when we look at these quotes uh, that I uh, took from the Wall Street Journal and CNN, uh, which shows the to what extent uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, willing to uh, supplement Iranian oil in the in international market. Uh, Prince Turki Al Faisal, then Saudi intelligence chef and ambassador to the US, uh, told in a closet door gathering in 2011 with uh, US, and military, uh, US and UK military officers uh, in a NATO airbase in the UK, he, sa uh, he said that Iran is vulnerable in oil sector and it's uh, there that more could be done to squeeze the, the current government. Saudi Arabia has so much spare production capacity, nearly 4 million barrels per day, that we could almost instantly replace all of the Iran's oil production. And, Ali, and similarly, Ali Al Naimi, then Saudi oil minister, also gave a, a similar uh, statement uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia could increase its production by 2 million barrels per day almost immediately. And at that time, Iranian uh, uh, oil export was uh, around roughly 2.5 million barrels per day. And so such a uh, Saudi initiative uh, to increase uh, oil production uh, would mean that uh, Saudi Arabia would make up for most of the Iranian supply. 
And Iran was aware of these uh, facts, and Iran, Iranian decision makers, and uh, also responded with threats, such as blocking the Strait of Hormuz or not allowing any Gulf state to export oil if Iran is not allowed to sell its oil, and other unexpected consequences. And uh, what kind of uh, consequences we have appeared itself actually in the in September 2019. And a series of drone attacks hit the Saudi oil uh, industry, uh, Saudi oil facilities in Abqaid and Quraysh, which was the heart of the uh, Saudi oil industry. And Saudi Arabia blamed Iran uh, of these attacks and the United States regarded this issue as an act of war uh, made by Iran. And uh, US Secretary of State visited, immediately visited Saudi Arabia to show uh, their solidarity with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and this, uh, all this happened uh, in a time when majority of Saudi oil was, uh, uh, has been exporting to uh, uh, Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, and China, rather than the Western countries uh, like United States. And uh, so the United States uh, primarily uh, showed uh, their uh, solidarity with the, uh, Saudi Arabia, even though uh, United States uh, didn't retaliate with the military operation against Iran. But Iran rejected all those Saudi American uh, accusations. And uh, actually there is no enough proof uh, that uh, we can uh, charge Iran with all those uh, attacks. Uh, but it's quite uh, difficult to believe that uh, all, those, uh, all those attacks uh, happened without the support of Iran. And so uh, these are all uh, that I want to say. And uh, sorry, uh, just uh, as a last sentence, I want I want I want to say that. And considering all those developments, oil emerged as a tool to intensify Saudi Iranian rivalry, but it has become possible with the presence uh, presence of U.S. structural power in the international system. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shukru. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, raises a lot of important questions and, and provokes a lot more, I think. Um, what we'll do after our final presentation is I will share a few of my thoughts as a, as a sort of informal discussant uh, ahead of opening up into the Q and A. Basically, I'm, I'm filling in for our our two. Uh, oh, sorry, our, our presenter who was unable to make it at the last minute. But our final presenter today is Gulbaris Sen, uh, who is at Tob University of Economics and Technology and Political Science. I'm really excited to hear her observations today. Um, it's going to be really interesting contribution to what's been a fascinating panel already. So I will ask you again, um, Gulriz, keep an eye on the chat function, please. I'll give you a, a quick okay. warning. I will ask the rest of you, if you have questions and comments, please put them in the Q&A box, share them on Twitter. Um, yeah, fantastic. Gulriz, the floor, the panel is yours. Okay, thank you, Simon, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Ankara. Um, let me share my PowerPoint presentation with you before I start. Okay, um, many thanks for organizing this excellent event. I'm very pleased to be a part of it and join this excellent discussion. As you see on your screens today, um, in my talk, I will reflect on Iran-US affairs and actually discuss the implications of Iran-US enmity uh, on the multipolarity of uh, Middle East politics. So, uh, as we all know, um, Iran continues to be a major preoccupation for US Middle East policy, even though United States has been in retreat, in a gradual retreat from the region since 2010. And of course, US is a major preoccupation for Iran's domestic politics and foreign policy uh, since the revolution. 
And what we observe is that after a brief interlude uh, of intense uh, diplomacy over nuclear crisis uh, during Barack Obama's presidency, Iran-US affairs are now again, once again, caught in a new web of crisis under Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, Donald Trump adopted a more stringent approach against Iran. As we all know, he pulled the US out of the GCPOA. Um, he intensified, I mean, the United States under his presidency intensified the uh, American efforts to uproot uh, Iran's influence from uh, Syria and Iraq. And from uh, on the early days of this very chaotic year 2020, uh, U.S. assassinated the mastermind of Iran's regional presence and po uh, policy, uh, General uh, Qasem Soleimani of Quds Force of IRGC. And of course, all these policies are compounded by uh, Washington's um, enormous financial pressure on Iran through sanctions, what it names as the maximum pressure policy, uh, which aims to strain uh, state society relations in Iran further. And what Tehran did was actually responding to this policy of maximum pressure with a maximum resistance policy, and uh, which was actually based on maintaining its already gained influence in the region, retaining its power position, plus targeting the expulsion of the United States uh, forces from the region. So what we see is that a, an old pattern is again on our horizon. Uh, the region is once again a medium, a venue for confrontation in Iran-US affairs. Uh, of course, we have many so sophisticated work, uh, work uh, on regional power competition and the rightful emphasis on regional agency, how regional actors are in competition with one another. Uh, but in my presentation, I would like to bring this international and external element more uh, into discussion, as we know that interna international or external has always been a part of regional power equation to varying degrees. And uh, US is uh, a declining hegemon, uh, I guess, and uh, Iran has always been, from 1979 onwards, a contester and condemned contender of uh, US hegemony and presence in the region. So uh, I would like to focus on their end with a brief overview of the background of this enmity, but uh, mostly by focusing on the Arab uprisings onwards era and try to probe this question. How does the deepening animosity in Iran-US affairs, particularly under Trump's uh, presidency, structure the strategies, alliance and alignment behavior in the Middle East? So that would be my uh, analysis. So uh, the scope of this question invites a look at regional actors, both sub-state and state actors, which are very much employed in Iran's regional policy, plus the role of international actors. Uh, as a venue, we have to take the politics of the Levant and the Persian Gulf into consideration when we analyze the Iran-US enmity. Uh, I'm leaving out the Afghanistan part, which has always been a, uh, with, which has always been mixed with uh, elements of uh, cooperation with competition. So my attention will be basically upon the action-reaction dynamics and co-constitutive uh, relationship of uh, U.S. and Iran's policies vis-à-vis -vis each other. But of course, uh, I will also uh, talk about regional actors, but uh, from the prism of the United States and Iran, but not on their own. So um, due to time constraints, I won't go very de uh, deep into detail in these sections, but it's uh, important, I guess, to emphasize that uh, we're talking about enmity in Iran-US affairs, but actually this is very much built upon uh, the end of a very strategic alliance uh, in, with the Iranian revolution. And from then onwards, uh, they turned into bitter adversaries, once very strategic allies. So there was a shift from the Nixon doctrine, which actually uh, asked the protection of strategic waterways of Persian Gulf with Iran under the Shah uh, to Carter Doctrine, whereby the United States had to fortify its, its presence in the region. Uh, we have been debating Iran-Iraq war uh, through very fruitful discussions today uh, in May's uh, presentation as well. Uh, so in, in Iran-Iraq war, we have seen the strategy of the United States uh, of containing and balancing revolutionary Iran with Iraq. But also U.S. made sure that Iran didn't totally collapse uh, and fell prey to Soviet encroachment. So there was a balanced uh, approach uh, in that regard. 
And what we talk today, I mean, the foundations of many actors and issues we have been talking today were laid in the 1980s in the immediate aftermath of the Iranian Revolution, the formation of the GCC in the Persian Gulf, and the formation of Hezbollah in Lebanon via Iran-Syria alliance uh, have to be noted in this regard. In the 1990s, we have a change in US policy of balancing Iran with Iraq uh, as now declared rogue states of the region. The uh, United States started to employ a policy of dual containment, so there was a policy shift in that regard. And we have seen Middle East peace process, which actually uh, made alarming calls for Iran because of the possibility of Israel's normalization in the region and Iran's only Arab state ally, Syria, leaving Iran than making peace with Israel. So there were these sorts of concerns. And uh, another crucial um, change and institutionalization of power was witnessed in the Persian Gulf security architecture right after the uh, Gulf crisis of 1990-1991, uh, which showed that, you know, US was to stay, but Iran was actually out of this uh, architecture, even though uh, Iran was expecting that the goodwill it showed during the crisis would beget goodwill, as United States was saying by then, but these were not really materialized. So this was a source of deep disappointment for Iran. And uh, regardless of these, what Iran actually tried to do in 1990s was to reintegrate into regional politics. As Olivia and Luciano uh, very succinctly argued, actually, you know, uh, the neighbors uh, played a very crucial role in Iran's regional policy. So mending fences with neighbors was very critical. So we have observed detente with Saudi Arabia right after the 1991 uh, the Gulf crisis. And Iran from then onwards was actually seen seeking for a collective security arrangement in the Gulf that would expel US forces and that would rightly install Iran into that framework. And uh, as one Iranian professor uh, mentioned, actually Iran's policy was containing the United States as United States was containing Iran. And uh, this was done through enhanced diplomatic ties with regional and international actors. Having said that, Iran also searched for some sort of moderation and modest vivendi with the United States as well under Rafsanjani and Hatemi administrations, but uh, these did not really uh, achieve uh, its efforts. So uh, the bulk of my presentation is actually related to related with the developments from uh, 2000s onwards uh, and the Arab uprisings. So as we all know, the most definitive shift took place with the Ira Iraq war in 2003, because now the US shifted from an offshore balancer into an occupying force in the region. And then of course, there were dramatic changes in the international politics of the Persian Gulf, which were uh, directly related with Tehran's uh, uh, expanding, soon expanding sphere of influence in the region. And this is the Persian Gulf part of it, plus there were major developments taking place in the Levant, which for Iran solidified its presence in the Levant. So there was some sort of connection between Iran's sphere of influence in the Persian Gulf and the Levant. And uh, Hamas parliamentary victory and Hezbollah's robust fight in July war in 2006 actually helped Iran to define itself more of a superpower in the Middle East. And that's during that time that in the literature we have seen reference to Iran as the regional powerhouse or you know the a pivotal state uh, you know uh, which is very critical in, in Middle Eastern issues. Of course, when we talk about U.S.-Iran enmity, we're not, we don't and we can't claim that Iran is a military match for the U.S. Uh, military, uh, you know, posture. However, uh, Iran actually registered great advances in asymmetric warfare, and this was basically uh, for the survival purposes against an imminent attack uh, from the U.S. and or Israel at the very height of the nuclear crisis. So the emergence of axis of resistance, which has seen its first real test actually in the Syrian civil war was uh, coming into shape during this era in which Iran was relying on non-state allies and proxies plus Syria as front lines and as means of deterrence uh, in the possibility of an attack against Iran. 
And in nuclear crisis, the nuclear program has turned to be a virtual deterrence card. And actually, having seen what happened to Iraq and Libya, Iran wanted to hold this political decision uh, to go nuclear as a leverage against the other actors. And it was looking for security assurances and obviously sanctions relief. Having said these military issues and competition, of course, there is one major element that Iran aptly uses in the region. Uh, it actually is started to, uh, you know, uh, bring forth an ideological assault against the U.S. with the emphasis of its dec declining hegemony. And here, it was riding on the region-wide anti-American sentiment as a source of public diplomacy over the so-called Arab Street. And of course, this was a very significant part of Iran's populist policies during Ahmadi Najat era at home and abroad. So this was what was taking place, place in 2000s. And in the Arab uprisings, uh, we have seen some, you know, interesting patterns in Iran-US relations, in which I'll, I'll mention in, in, in a minute. So what we see is extended role for regional actors, obviously, and this was very much uh, allowed by systemic changes, by the structural gaps and retreat of the United States from the region. Uh, it was claiming under Obama administration that, you know, it was leading from behind and its regional allies actually have to take care uh, of the business uh, in the region, not the United States at the forefront, even though, you know, U.S. had uh, made a partial return to the region to fight with ISIS after uh, 2014. At the very start of the Arab uprisings, Iran's vision was very clear, you know, it was a zero-sum game, a competition between Iran and the United States, but soon this competition was very much complicated by, you know, growing regional competition among among the regional actors and that's why we have seen discussions of the new Middle East, Middle East Cold War which was very much centered on the rise of Iran-Saudi Arabia competition and as discussed uh, very uh, fruitfully yesterday there was a growing alignment of Gulf monarchies and Israel against Iran putting Iran at the spotlight as the gravest threat to the region and the societies and as we all know the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was uh, to a great extent and sidelined by the Syrian civil war and this actually provided a room for rather sometimes covert, sometimes overt alignment of Gulf monarchies and Israel. And there, you know, uh, the regional actors were in opposition to Iran's nuclear deal. And th this is actually the irony of the Arab uprisings. So they were fearful of Iran's growing uh, influence in the region, but they were also fearful, they were really afraid of a possible normalization of U.S. ties with Iran. So they were afraid that U.S. was pivoting to Asia and actually leaving them at the mercy of Iran in the region. And while they were themselves, I mean, the Gulf actors were themselves Asianized. So the decline in, in U.S. hegemony and American interest for involvement in the region was compounded by the rising fears of Iran's hegemony with references to Persian Empire and Shiite Crescent. And actually Turkey was among those actors who, who voiced these concerns or as to the Persian Empire as well, not only the Gulf actors. So in the rest of the time I have, I will talk about the patterns and characteristics of U.S. policy and Iran's policy and how they actually impact upon the alliances and alignments. So this is basically mostly the Trump era that I will be talking on. So uh, what I observe is that, you know, Iran, tensions with Iran lead to varying U.S. responses. Uh, there is lack of a clear and predictable policy, albeit the presence of a very clear anti-Iran posture. On the nuclear issue, we have this maximum pressure policy, heightened sanctions. Uh, but of course, there are debates as to whether this is intended for regime change in regime behavior or a change in the regime. So this actually intends intensifies Tehran's concerns. Uh, U.S. can't leave the region to keep an eye on, on Iran. So this was a discussion we have seen in Syria as firstly made by Rex Tillerson and pursued by uh, other U.S. officials. And uh, there's back and forth movement of U.S. forces, but still U.S. wants to retain a certain element of presence, physical presence, to actually deter Iran from engaging further and solidifying its influence. 
Uh, it grants allies, again, it relies more on allies, uh, a free hand for operations. We have, we observed this a lot in the last three years in Israel's airstrikes in Syria uh, against uh, Iran's militias, Iran-controlled militias and uh, the arms depots, etc. But of course, this uh, has to take a green light from Russia as well. And uh, former examples has been the GCC Peninsula Shield Force Operation against Bahrain protest, the Saudi-sponsored Yemen war. They always have this idea of uh, checking Iran to a certain extent in these world theaters. Uh, what I would say is that U.S. offers a mostly discursive protection. Yes, there are massive arm deals, but the Aramco attacks showed that, you know, the U.S. would leave the decision to retaliate to Saudi Arabia and wouldn't go for uh, a Saudi Arabia war, right? So this was actually uh, taken from Trump's statements. And of course, there's an ongoing investigation and uh, there's no clear proof that Iran was uh, responsible for the attacks, but there's a great suspicion uh, that Iran uh, is behind the attacks uh, and uh, besides the Aramco attacks this anti-missile defense shield issue has never been actualized that the Gulf actors are looking for uh, US help. And it at times uh, tries to change the rules of deterrence with Iran. So the assassination of Soleimani has been a very bold attempt, but actually by doing so, it invited greater uncertainty and instability to the region. Uh, we, we have this unfulfilled regional initiative of Middle East Strategic Alliance, the Arab-NATO initiative, uh, in which you know, the parties uh, couldn't really arrive at, uh, at, at a common, uh, let's say, uh, position and Egypt uh, left the initiative and you know there is ongoing crisis within the GCC as this initiative includes all the GCC members and this unpredictability and mistrust invites US allies a growing interest with other international players, players such as Russia and China. If we uh, look at Iran's policy, the patterns and characteristics of Iran's policy, we see that Iran actually has this balancing and deterrence strategy uh, played out at, with multiple actors at multiple levels. At the regional level, I can cite sub-state actors and state actors. Sub-state actors, as we all know, is you know the militiaization of uh, the regional politics with the Arab uh, Spring, as Robert Springborg uh, denoted. So the militias in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Lebanon they played a very uh, significant role and Iran actually found a greater place in weak Arab states and now seeks for institutionalizing this material presence but only not only in security terms but also in economic terms as well uh, I will leave the discussions to Q&A since I'm running out of time and state actors you know uh, this part is also crucial of course Iran wants to preserve the alliance with Syria but also it wants to um, strengthen its alignment with Qatar in the GCC crisis and and also, Iran is re, has realigned with Turkey to a great extent in the post-2016 period by propping up the growing mistrust between Turkey and the United States and highlighting cooperation over competition, regional competition. Uh, fortifying the excess of resistance matters and actually integrating the uh, pro-Iran PMU, the Hashti Shabi militias to this excess uh, matters a lot, but this would complicate Iran-Iraq relations uh, seemingly. And of course, Iran builds upon the divisions within the GCC and currently making attempts to reach out United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia as well. And uh, Luciano and Olivia uh, talked uh, about the Rouhani's coalition for hope. So uh, in that regard, uh, I don't want to repeat what they said, but you know, this has been at least this has shown Iran's continuous uh, search for a collective security arrangement in the Persian Gulf and the Rouhani administration made uh, its move with this Coalition for Hope initiative. And plus, uh, we, Iran looks for regional outlets to sustain trade, economic and political relations because Iran needs these connections under the duress of American sanctions. So this is also how, you know, U.S. strategies reflect on Iran's uh, search for uh, alignments in the region. And of course, uh, the last point I would mention as to Iran's policy, uh, patterns of Iran's policy is inviting more global slash international actors to balance the United States in the region. So this is not only in the region, but also at the United Nations Security Council, given the US campaign to extend the oil embargo and for snapback san uh, UN sanctions uh, in the GCPOA. 
uh, with Russia, we see more uh, cooperation on strategic security issues and with China more on economic and infrastructural issues. This is actually a continuation of the look to the East policy to balance out West. And this West notion keeps changing. It's mostly US, but uh, given the disappointment of Iran vis-a-vis uh, -vis the EU in actually compensating the US withdrawal from the treaty, sometimes EU is also integrated into this framework. But of course, this framework is not out of uh, its problems. There is a definite competition between Iran and Russia over Syria. And of course, the complexities of US-China affairs bears upon you know, Iran-China uh, relations as well. So in lieu of conclusion, if I'm to conclude, I can say that Iran-US enmity is deeply related with a number of notions, hegemony, a hard and soft power and dynamics of cooperation and conflict in the region through alignments and alliances. Um, from a historical sociology point of view, I would also uh, argue that this enmity very much structured the institutions, identity, political economy and foreign policy of Iran, Iran's agency to a great extent. And what we see is that Iran's national security, particularly from 2000s onwards, assumed a very regional framework built upon non-state and sub-state allies. Uh, there is a dilemma in US and its allies relationship uh, considering Iran. Uh, that is another observation. US looks for regional allies and partners to contain and check Iran's rise because um, I mean this is the case. This was the case in leading from behind. This is also the case in America first policy. And meanwhile, regional allies, in fear of Iran's response and retaliation, want the U.S. to step in and balance Iran. Yet, of course, too much tension in Iran-U.S. affairs risks their security further, as the recent uh, policies of maximum pressure and Soleimani's assassination have shown. Uh, as a remedy, and as uh, I mean, thinking about future, what what should be done? Uh, I think there is a definite need for regional initiatives to sort out contentious problems. But for that, we need confidence-building measures. Iran is very much associated with fear, but I mean, how to associate it with uh, trust is another issue. And uh, with the Arab uprisings, this mistrust is very much deepened. And of course, there is a vitality of a modus vivendi, if not total normalization in Iran-US affairs, if we are to manage uh, the multipolarity of MENA and take it from a contentious framework into a more managed uh, framework. So I stop here. Thanks for listening. I'm looking for uh, your comments and questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gulras. Um, can I ask presenters again to switch off their cameras and microphones just for um, for the period where we're having the discussion? As and when we come back to you for your comments, I'll ask you to please switch them back on. But for now, um, please keep them off, Shukru. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a little bit of time due to the um, the slight change in panel order. So I thought I'd add a couple of brief observations on on these three really interesting papers and then we can we can delve into the Q&A. So please do put your questions in the Q&A. We've got a couple in there already, um, but I'm sure that with three provocative papers and a, a really interesting set of topics, there's a lot for us to to reflect on. So listening to this, <laughs> there's there's a number of different ways in which these um, these sets of questions and debates can play out. Broadly speaking, we're looking at multipolarity here, um, the theme of the conference, but also the theme of the the panel and Iran's position within these discussions of of multipolarity. And I think there's two two immediate points that need to be addressed. One is. Are we talking about multipolarity in the Gulf or in the Middle East or in the in the global context? What is the, the idea of multipolarity here and where does Iran position itself? And how should we understand Iran in this context? Should we see Iran as, um, as a middle power, as an aspiring middle power, as a regional hegemon, as an aspiring regional hegemon, or, or as something else? And, Adham Saouli has got a, a new edited collection coming out later this week that looks at this concept of middle powers. And I think it's something that, that is actually really quite interesting and can help shed light on, on a number of these questions. But I think asking these questions with regard to Iran can help us to understand some of the actions that the Islamic Republic is, is taking 
um, across the Gulf and across the Middle East more broadly. So, so thinking about how to conceptualize Iran in terms of a state that's operating in, in international relations and in terms of the arena in which we're, we're talking. And then I think once we've got that, it can help us to then reflect on, on some more empirically driven issues. Because it's, it's pretty evident that Iranian actions aren't in a vacuum. And as, as Gulrez was observing, there's this sense of a co-constituent movement and that we know that um, the United States or Saudi Arabia or Israel will do one thing and then Iran will respond. Or on the flip side, Iran will, will act in a particular way and then the Saudis, Israelis, the United States, etc. will respond. Or, or um, beyond that, of course, Iranian allies, Hezbollah, um, Hamas, whoever it may be, can engage in some form of activity that can then prompt a response from some, somewhere, someone. So there's this, this really multifaceted and complex set of relationships that are helping shape Iranian activity that mean it's, the state isn't acting in a vacuum, that it's shaped by and determined by structural factors. Um, these structural factors, of course, take place domestically, regionally and internationally. So as Luciano and Olivia were observing, there's this sense that the structural factors inside the Islamic Republic have a, a key role to play in determining the, the nature of engagement with, with regional states. And, and this period in the early 1990s is, is you were suggesting, and Golar is sinting out, and Shukru has done some work on as well, of an apparent rapprochement with Saudi Arabia, I find really fascinating because there you've got a sense of, um, of an opening up, perhaps, in both Iran and in Saudi Arabia, whereby you've got uh, a crown prince in Saudi Arabia who's, who's more, um, more disposed to dialogue, and you've got maybe more reform-minded uh, officials in Iran who were able to capitalize on, on a weakened position of Ali Khamenei, who's come to replace Khomeini, of course, and there's, there's opportunities, there's structural opportunities domestically. But here, and this is uh, something to flag up for, for Luciano and Olivia, you're talking about this web, wedding together of ideology and pragmatism. And I, I totally understand why you're doing that. But I wonder if you can say a little bit more here about how these concepts evolve, because it strikes me that you don't have a, a fixed notion of, of pragmatism here. And you don't necessarily have a fixed notion of ideology, although you may have fixed parameters within which actors in the Iranian state can operate. And the example I, I always tend to give here is when people ask about this is, yes, you have opposition movements in Iran, um, but you have opposition movements who are working within the context of Veliyeti uh, Fakhi, and then you have opposition movements who are operating outside the parameters that have of that which are tolerated by the state. So you've got different types of parameters here, different types of structural um, determinations and, and constraints. So I wonder if you can say a little bit about how ideology and pragmatism evolve over time and how the evolving understandings of pragmatism and indeed ideology impact on, on one another. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a question for Olivia and Luciano. Then moving beyond that, this engagement between Iran and the GCC is, is equally interesting and important. It, again, I don't think it's, it's fixed. Again, I think it's shaped by a range of structural factors. And so I wonder if this can be addressed to, um, well, addressed by any of you, how did those external structural factors, be it regional or international, impact on the capacity for Iran to operate in a, in a positive way with regard to um, its GCC neighbours? I want to put aside um, its relations with Hezbollah and other non-state actors for the moment. I, I realise that they are absolutely key, but here I want to look at, at structural factors that can can facilitate or indeed inhibit uh, efforts to, to facilitate rapprochement and dialogue and engagement with, with other members of the GCC states. What are the opportunities to, um, to mitigate tensions, to de-escalate, or conversely, 
um, what are the what are the factors that lead to increased escalation? Um, I find this this relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia particularly interesting in the case of, of Iran. Uh, I was doing a talk at Harvard a couple of years ago um, on this topic of Saudi Iranian relations and one of the questions that I got at the end is why are you even bothering doing this talk because the talk should be about Saudi Iranian relations it should be about US um, Iran relations and I found that a little bit problematic because that just denies Saudi agency but here I think it was um, it was Gulriz and Luciano and Olivia who, who flagged it up. There's this period in the 1990s where there's a rapprochement between Tehran and Riyadh. But then at the same time, you've got this US policy of, of acting for a sort of a dual containment or a co-containment, I think it, it was termed. So I wonder if, if a bit can be said on that. How do you have this, this close relationship that many kind of bind up together as, as this one um, very close uh, set of actors who are operating uh, in, in tandem, in unison, with regard to one thing. But then you have this period where they're going off on completely different trajectories. Um, I think there's an interesting point to be made about the construction of, of this Shia crescent and, and regional hegemony. And I wonder if, if all three... Well, maybe um, Luciano and Olivia and Gulliris can say a little bit about how that construction of a Shia crescent and indeed construction of, of ideas of Persian hegemony, and I stress Persian, of course, not Iranian hegemony, how does that impact on GCC relations with Iran? And then how does the GCC crisis impact, uh, what, what opportunities does it give Iran? What does the crisis do with, for, for Iranian efforts to, to engage more with the region? And a, a question for Shukru, uh, how does this COVID-19 crisis and the, the recent oil crisis between the Saudis and the Russians impact on, on Iran's position here? I think we've got a, a real complex web of factors that interact, that play out in a range of different ways. And there's all kinds of different structural forces impacting on, on a, a very complex state that is engaging in a whole host of different activities. Um, some of them are, are pretty positive in terms of peace building. Others, of course, are pretty abhorrent in terms of its actions elsewhere. So you've got all these different tensions, all these contradictions, all these structural pressures operating parabolically. Um, and I guess I'm just curious to hear some more thoughts in terms of those different directions that I've just sort of pointed out, I guess. So maybe I'll give each one of you just a minute or two to respond to anything that I've just said, and then we can open the floor to more questions. If I can ask you again, please um, put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, if that's okay, just so uh, we can keep things nice and tidy. But... I will ask you, um, probably in the order of speakers, just to give a quick response to some of my observations. So, Luciano and Olivia, please, the floor is yours for maybe 30 seconds each. Hi, thank you so much, Simon, for, for all these uh, comments and also ideas that you have, have given us, actually. Um, so you actually you mentioned many many things um you first i think you were touching on um uh, ideology and pragmatism and how those two concepts are influencing each other how they're evolving over time right so well this is also one of the things that we're trying to to um to cover in in our paper um we can say that, I mean, a little bit in line with what we said in the paper or in the presentation before that um, ideology sets a discursive frame. So pragmatism happens, but still um, the Iranian elite, and we're talking here about the, the, the discourses of the Iranian political elite, they try to move within this ideological discursive frame. So um, let me think about a practical example. So we 
we can see for uh, uh, with the JCPOA, for example, engaging with negotiations, finally entering the agreement and signing it, um, would potentially contradict um, Iran's rhetoric, Iran's idea about engaging with um, what they have been called the, <clears throat> sorry, the great Satan or the big evil, so to say, but nonetheless, um, since it was perceived to be conducive to Iran's interests, also discursively staying within the ideological frame, was, uh, ways were found to, um, I don't want to say to justify, but yes, to say this is still in line with us. And here, as an example, we could um, mention the concept of um, uh, heroic flexibility um, that comes up in this context. So saying, um, all right, we also, while being sometimes um, um, standing on our principles, there are also times when we should show ourselves um, in a flexible way. Um, so in this context, ideology is not subordinate to, um, uh, to the pragmatism, but, but rather the other way around, it would help that, it would help that along. Yeah. If I may, I, I want to reply another of your comments uh, in my 30 sec seconds. Uh, how do you, how Iran sees itself? Uh, I think that, of course, that the idea of uh, being a regional power has been uh, the long-term objective of Iranian foreign policy since the times of the Shah, uh, and this continued during the times of uh, after the Islamic uh, Revolution and the establishment of the Islamic Republic. The problem is they they changed their tools and the justification uh, to become a regional power. Uh, my, my point, and this is something we discussed with uh, Olivia, and we discussed with, with other, other people as well, is uh, if Iran achieved that goal of becoming regional power or not, bearing in mind that in order to be recognized as a regional power, you need the approval from the global power out and also the acceptation from the immediate neighbors that they actually are uh, subject to um, the Iranian foreign policy or we are suffering the, 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 the Iranian foreign policy to, to, to use a uh, word. Uh, the point is that with this initiative, we, when we compare the, the initiative, the Iranian engagement initiatives, we see that the Iran has been more successful in attracting international support when the scope of the initiative was bigger than the regional um, environment than when the initiatives were very uh, circumscribed to, to the region. For instance, hope initiative was only targeting six countries, while dialogue, dialogue among civilizations where they were targeting even the whole world. And they got approved by the United Nations General Assembly, they got the support by other countries, uh, third world countries, uh, while the more focused initiatives on security arrangement, they got less support. So of course, Iran wants, wants to be a regional power, they have the tools to become a regional power, but they don't have the acceptation from uh, the regional neighbors, although they have the recognition sometimes from the more broader uh, environment. Uh, well, there are many things that you, you raise. I don't think we can address uh, all of them. You, you, you ask about what are the factors that they may contribute to the escalation with the GCC. I think we pass by many opportunities in which those factors appear. For instance, what happened with the COVID-19 was an element that could have helped to realize that the, the threats in the region are global, they're affecting all the countries in the same way, and there is no border that can uh, stop that. Uh, and this was a good opportunity to, to find uh, uh, an element that could, ha could have contributed to have a cooperative or a cooperation between all the states to tackle the, the issues and the problems uh, given by the COVID. So far, we didn't see that much, although you can see that Iran started to de-escalate to some extent with other GC states, for instance, with, with the Emirates, something that already started to happen before, uh, even before the killing of uh, Soleimani uh, in the second half of 2019. Uh, there are factors, the problem is uh, if there are Will political will to 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 engage in this kind of um, of uh, constructive dialogue with, with Iran from the other side as well. Uh, 
I leave it to the others and maybe we can we can we can continue on. anon, I think. Sorry? We can continue anon, Luciano and Olivia. Later on. Another okay, time. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Uh Shukru, anything you'd like to pick up on? Uh, sorry. Yes. And so regarding the uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, over the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, I can say that, and sometimes uh, the natural disasters uh, create some uh, good opportunities uh, for engaging and for cooperation uh, between rival states. And for example, in, uh, in 1990, we experienced such kind of uh, thing uh, in when the Iranian uh, when Iran experienced a severe earthquake uh, and uh, later it paved the way for uh, rapprochement uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And also uh, in another uh, cases, for example, in, after the 1999 earthquake in uh, Turkey, for example, Turkey and Greece uh, experienced a, and uh, cooperative uh, relations after the uh, and it, it created a climate for uh, cooperation between two rival states so uh, after the covid 1919 uh, uh, sorry covid 19 uh, uh, i can say that the, this uh, this uh, illness uh, this uh, epidemic uh, drained the main sources of uh, two governments uh, economic resources like uh, oil prices uh, plummet, dramatically plummeted and uh, so Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, struggled with the, we began to struggle with the uh, economic uh, problems. So any, any rider or conflict needs uh, some economic resources uh, in a time when uh, if you have some struggle with uh, uh, economy and if you don't have enough uh, economic resources, it's quite difficult to continue the same uh, degree of conflicts with uh, other uh, states. So uh, the COVID-19 uh, might be an opportunity for a rapprochement again between the Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, I am not sure uh, in regarding the complex of the relations between two states. So, yeah. Thanks, Shukru. Gulriz, anything you'd like to add before we go on to the Q&A? Um, I have three points to mention. Um, one is about uh, how Iran defines multipolarity. Um, I mean, the uh, answers to these questions uh, also depend on which political faction is talking in Iran, uh, obviously. Uh, I would say that, for example, reformist or more pragmatist uh, centers in Iranian politics would, you know, uh, allow for a limited U.S. presence uh, because they would say that, you know, the other, otherwise it wouldn't be too realistic to expect, you know, a, a U.S. expelled uh, region. So there is room for U.S., but it must be as limited as possible. And of course, the ideal scenario is that the U.S. leaves the region. And um, in that regard, I mean, in, if you look at the discussions in the literature, yes, Iran is obviously taken as a middle power. And uh, I mean, analytically speaking, it's a middle power. But as Luciano argued, I mean, there is a problem of recognition. There is a problem of normalization. And still, the decade of 80s uh, resonates a lot uh, in, in the construction of Iranian threat. Plus, I have one more issue to add in this first response. Uh, Iran also sees itself as a power of West Asia. And in that regard, we see the strength of this uh, anti-colonial posture, and I mean, uh, in, in Iran, anti-imperialism, saying that, you know, Middle East is a very um, loaded term, and actually Iran is one of the nations, very historical nations, uh, big nations, let's say, uh, of uh, West Asia. So uh, that's something I would like to add. And I have two more comments. One is regarding how this um, construction of Shi'i Crescent and Persian hegemony actually uh, reflect on the GCC uh, politics. Um, one thing comes to my mind about this Shiite crescent is that, of course, this was voiced by um, King Abdullah of Jordan. 
And uh, if we look to the Arab Spring era and how Jordan uh, has been boosted by the GCC, not to fall prey to any protest and to side with the GCC, the monarchies of the region, we can say that cre creating such a threat perception actually help alignment of other forces more and more. And the other one is about the Persian hegemony, uh, the Persian expansionism, as I mentioned in my talk, this was also used by um, uh, Turkey as well, uh, when Turkey and Iran were actually going through intense competition in Syria and Iraq. There, I think it was a way to escape from sectarian entrapment uh, and actually put more, you know, nationalism at the spotlight. So bring it to a more, I mean, to make it uh, less uh, sectarian and more an issue of, you know, nationalism. So they're all mixed up, but this is how it is reflected in, uh, in, in the jargon, I would say. And lastly, uh, the GCC crisis, uh, provided an apt opportunity for Iran to make use of, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, alignment with Qatar uh, proved a very significant uh, bonus for Iran uh, to divide the GCC politics and not to let uh, not to let GCC to act as a whole against uh, against Iran. But of course, this was also used for uh, Iran's uh, realignment with Turkey as well, as they both sided with Qatar. So I would say that this is not only related with the Persian Gulf politics, but this is also a food with Iran's uh, ongoing search for uh, mending relations, improving relations with Turkey as well. So this is all for, uh, for me now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you. Right. We have some questions coming in into the Q&A. And what we've done thus far is we've put aside questions from the, the organizing team and ask questions from our audience first of all. So we have um, three questions that we'll take in this first round from Aidan Parks, Omar, Munassar and Shabnam Holiday. So Aidan's question, and I'm going to paraphrase Aidan, um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, thinking about KSA, Iran rivalry and US oil hegemony, US participation in the Iran negotiations eased Western sanctions on Iran in 2015. Yet uh, a few months later, the Saudis execute Shia cleric Nimr al-Nimr, um, diplomatic relations erode after the nuclear deal. Um, the Saudis and the Iranians take uh, increasingly hostile positions against one another. Um, Iran gets relative global access to markets, but the rivalry endures. What do you make of the role of oil in the KSA Iran rivalry during this period? And after the determinism of crude oil in the international system, could KSA Iran oil rivalry shift to energy politics and climate strategy broadly, converting crude oil and natural gas stocks into petrochemicals, etc.? So, Shakru, a question for you there. Um, then we have a question from Omar. To Luciano, you addressed ideology and pragmatism as separate themes. But we see Iranian factions only shift from one ideology to another, and this how I understood pragmatism. How does this make a difference between the two themes? And then we have a question from Shabnam, and this is to, to everyone. Dear all, thank you for a great set of papers. I would be interested to know how you think uh, Iran's role in the region relates to our understanding of regional order. Okay, so three really interesting questions there. I'll second Shabnam's point. These were three really interesting, insightful papers. Uh, certainly lots to get our teeth into. So Shukru, would you like to kick us off with uh, that, that really interesting question from Aidan, please? Yes. Just I want to emphasize that the oil issue is uh, quite related with other factors and there are a broad range of factors that shape the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, uh, including the uh, ge geopolitical uh, uh, rival, uh, including the uh, regional hegemony or uh, including the ideological uh, uh, expansionism etc etc and they are all interlinked with each other and i am uh, not uh, separating uh, those factors from the role of oil and yeah for example particularly uh, when we regard the domestic spheres of uh, uh, saudi arabia and iran uh, the rich oil resources exist in the regions uh, where the most uh, dissident groups lives for example, in the uh, eastern province of Saudi Arabia, 
uh, are uh, are are uh, the are the places of the Shia uh, Saudi Shia who are quite influenced uh, by the by the by by Iran. Uh, at least uh, Saudi regime are accusing uh, Iranian side like that. And at the same time, uh, the Iranian oil-rich region uh, uh, exists in the Kuzestan region, which are uh, inhabited by the uh, Iranian Arabs. And they are also uh, inf uh, attempted to be influenced by the Saudi Arabia and other uh, Gulf uh, countries. And Iranian uh, governments also accusing uh, the regional uh, Arab countries to intervene into the uh, domestic spheres of uh, Iran and provoke uh, their uh, dissident groups. And therefore, uh, it is quite difficult to uh, separate, the, uh, separate the oil issue with the other uh, factors. And so then uh, the, the time when the sectarian uh, confli conflicts uh, increased uh, in the by the uh, by the uh, by the killing of the nimr al nimr and uh, also other uh, de developments uh, by the 2015 and oil uh, began to be regarded as a weapon against iran uh, by saudi arabia but uh, with the support of uh, uh, United States as well, particularly with the Trump administration. And if we come to the point of uh, the, the question of uh, whether uh, Saudi Iranian rivalry can uh, can shift the uh, energy uh, dependence on uh, on uh, Persian, uh, on the on the Gulf, uh, I can. Uh, Actually, I uh, couldn't say that such kind of uh, development uh, could shift the energy, energy issue from Middle East to other parts of the world. And actually, the Saudi Arabia and Iran, yes, they have uh, great resources of uh, petroleum in their country and any uh, conflicts or instability can easily uh, undermine the stability of uh, international energy, energy uh, international uh, energy, and so uh, yeah. But but uh, they have very uh, limited influence over the inter uh, international energy politics. Why? Because uh, the prices of oil, for example, uh, you know, um, prices of uh, oil uh, was determined by also the consuming states uh, decisions uh, for example when they don't need to oil uh, we will uh, we can see the huge uh, amount of uh, oil supplies in the international market so and also uh, in the recent years we observed that uh, a, gr a great uh, number of and the increasing number of oil producers uh, emerge in the market uh, for example, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, United States oil production increased to 15 million barrels per day, and uh, and this 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 made the United States the number one country in the world in oil production, and uh, so uh, they have uh, yes they have uh, some impacts over the energy uh, market, but. Uh, it impacted uh, by the interference uh, of the external powers like uh, United States and also mitigated by the increasing uh, production level of other uh, oil producers. Yeah, yeah, I can say all those things. Thank you, Shukru. Okay, uh, Luciano Libya, we'll ask you to, um, to be as brief as possible so we can get on to uh, another round of questions. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Simon. I'll be Luciano for a second <laughs> to, to answer to Omar's question. Uh, hi, Omar, again. Um, so you were wondering about the division between pragmatism and, um, and ideology. In fact, I think this was the, 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 the point we, we would like to make in our argument that um, the ideology is inherently pragmatic so that we're actually not 
we're not dividing this in, in fact. I think this is, this is it, Simon, you can go on. Simon? I think we lost Simon. Uh, I'm still here. I'm just getting some uh, weird yeah. imagery. Please carry on. I think I mean I mean we are okay with the the answer that the Olivia gave. I don't know which answer, which other answer you want to, which other question you want to be replied. I lost the track, sorry. Well, if you're done, then I'll pass it on to, uh, to the final question from Shabnam. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Whoever wants to kick us off with that. Maybe Gulriz, you could start. Uh, sure. Um, thank you for this great question, actually. Um, uh, how I can reply is this way. I, Iran actually contested regional order a lot. Uh, particularly, this was the case in the 1990s when the US hegemony was building a new world order and a new Middle East. So from then onwards, even though Iran was moderating its behavior, it was also challenging the order uh, that it, it really contested. And uh, from our discussions, I mean, not only in this panel, but in other uh, discussions uh, made in other panels as well, we see that Middle East is, uh, still goes on to be a contested region and it is very divided um, through certain lines, uh, of course. Um, and in that regard, uh, Iran plays a significant role. And there are uh, numerous discussions as to why, you know, many actors who are opposed to Iran are actually underbalancing Iran, etc. These sorts of issues. So, from Iran's perspective, what uh, what I would say is that yes, it contests the uh, region, regional order, U.S. based or Israeli based regional order. But so far, its efforts are not enough to build a region which is the most favorable uh, to its own. And to do so, it would need, you know, uh, inclusion in the Persian security Gulf uh, architecture. Uh, it it would want to retain its ties to the Levant. I mean, um, all these struggles that Iran is currently enmeshed with, if they achieve, succeed their goals, that would be an order uh, to Iran's most liking, I suppose. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of other questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'll add in another call for questions uh, from from participants who are still with us but whilst i'm i'm urging you all to add any questions any burning questions that you may have there's a, a really fascinating question from from eddie wasnage here and again this can go to all of you so if i'll ask you all to to maybe offer a short response to this given that that the us featured prominently in your in your papers uh maybe perhaps more so in Shukru and Gulariz's than, than Luciano and Olivia's, but I think it still applies. Eddie's suggesting that um, there's this idea of the US as a declining hegemon in the region. Um, been long-term discussions about a US withdrawal from the region as well. So his question is, what is, is your view of how Iran might position itself in a possible post-US Middle East in the future? So a bit of speculation time here, I think. Do please put your cameras on if you'd like whilst you're answering. Um, we'll start at the the other end of the of the uh, lineup. So, Gulruz, do you want to go first on this one? Sure. Sure. 
Um, this is an excellent question. I think uh, Iran has been thinking about this, might be or must be thinking about this a lot because that's the goal of uh, Iran. I mean, to to uh, expel the U.S. forces from the region, and this has been a much proclaimed goal right after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, because this has been seen as you know uh, the ultimate you know slap on the face of the enemy, as uh, the Supreme Leader Khamenei uh, argued. Uh, right after Iran's retaliation. So, I mean, uh, the end of US order in the Middle East would probably um, serve for Iran's ontological, you know, uh, security and physical security, if we are to make a connection and a build a bridge with the previous discussions of the keynote panel. So, because Iran suffers from uh, an ontological insecurity, plus uh, the, you know, a physical insecurity at times uh, when, you know, the war was always on the table. Um, but I, ironically, I would say that yes, this would be a good news for Iran. But on the other hand, it may have uh, some domestic implications because anti-Americanism has been very strong in so. This may be two ways, I suppose. So this is this would be my speculation on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Shukru. A quick response in terms of energy politics and oil. What would happen in a, how would Iran respond to a post-U.S. Middle East? And uh, as uh, Gudris uh, emphasized that uh, Iran. Uh, if one of the Iranian aim is to uh, is to see a region uh, without the influence of U.S. and uh, but um, I am uh, critically approaching uh, to the uh, to the uh, argument that U.S. Uh, regional hegemony has been declining. When I uh, regarding the uh, for example the presence uh, presence of uh, U.S. Uh, in the region, uh, for example over uh, the just publicly acknowledged, uh, acknowledged information uh, that the United States still has uh, a, a military bases over the 12 uh, countries in the Middle East. And uh, so, but yes, uh, United States after the, after the experience uh, in, the, in the Iraqi invasion, uh, the United States uh, doesn't want to involve into the uh, in, involve, directly involved into the military uh, operation in the in the region, uh, but uh, it's uh, preferring to uh, keep its presence with a limited number of, uh, for example, soldiers or uh, and the and the and the military bases. And uh, for example, when we are regarding the problem in Syria, we are uh, we are also considering the impact of uh, United States as well as uh, Russia, and uh, therefore um, it is very uh, I think problematic. Uh, it seems to it, is, it seems to me that uh, you know declining U.S. hegemony in the region seems to be quite uh, problematic for me uh, regarding this uh, event. And but if if uh, uh, if uh, uh, United States uh, leave the region, uh, absolutely it would be very very good news for Iran. And Iran wants to uh, deal with its uh, bilateral uh, problems or uh, conducting bi bilateral uh, relations with the regional states like Saudi Arabia, other Gulf uh, countries, uh, without the impact of United States because. Uh, Iran regarded itself uh, is a greater uh, greater uh, power in in the sense in in, in a way of uh, long history in the region or uh, the big uh, power uh, uh, big power uh, uh, factors uh, like the big uh, population in the uh, in the Middle East and uh, bigger military. Uh, uh, military capacity in the in the midst, uh, in the in the Middle East. Uh, so, Iran wants to uh, deal with its bilateral problems uh, with the with the regional uh, states, uh, 
without the interference of the United States. And it will absolutely uh, uh, increase the uh, in, uh, in, increase the uh, opportunities for Iran to, you know, uh, trade its uh, oil with uh, across the world. So, yeah, I can I can uh, stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Shukru, uh, Luciano, and Olivia. And again, if I can ask you to be as as brief and succinct as possible, because then I have one final question that will bring together the two remaining questions in um in the q a so over to you okay if i may reply this uh, i think uh iran has been getting ready for a post uh, u.s middle east since the beginning of the islamic uh, revolution but the same as it happened with all the, the 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 people that predicted the fall of the iranian regime since long time ago iran has been predicting the fall of the uh, american hegemony in the Middle East since a long time ago. And so far, I don't see any of those uh, happening. We, we, we thought that with Obama, uh, the United States was shrinking in the Middle East, and with Trump, we see that it is already there again, but with a different uh, justification or rationale. Uh, again, uh, Iran, during, during the 2019, has been predicting the, the, the fall of the, Iranian, the, the American hegemony in the, in the region, and they are getting ready for that again. But to be honest, I don't see that this is beneficial for Iran because they will lose this uh, ideational uh, element that is always uh, in the Iranian foreign policy that they need to contest the American presence in, in the region. So they are expecting this to happen, but if that happens, they will have no uh, big enemy uh, uh, to justify uh, foreign policy actions uh, beyond their own borders. On the other hand, that, uh, that said, I think that Iran uh, is trying to push its position itself as a regional power, not as a regional hegemon, uh, but as a country that can really protect or can provide protection for the neighboring countries, uh, the same way that happened during the Twin Pillars policy during the time of the Shah, but without receiving orders from a global power. I think that this, that, that's why I, I think hope is a genuine initiative that Iran wants to provide, wants, wants to be the umbrella of the GCC states in terms of security, uh, but to protect them against external or even internal uh, enemies, enemies, but without being ordered from the United States, Russia, or with, which, which other uh, country would like to be involved uh, in the region. Of course, for that to happen, you need the acceptance from the, the regional uh, actors that so far I don't see this is uh, is happening but i think this is the scenario that iran would would like to 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 have uh, an environment in which is uh, stable i mean instability was never favoring iran i mean this is uh, also a wrong conception that some uh, scholars have that iran is always interested in breaking the status quo i think iran is trying to preserve an status quo but of course an status quo that is benefiting uh, iran and not benefiting an external power nor uh, its enemies. Uh, but I think that stability is always in the mind of Iran. And Iran perceives that he's, uh, in the, the Iran is the only country that can guarantee that stability uh, without the presence of external powers. This is more or less what I can say about that. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. We have two minutes left on our panel. And so I'd like to fuse two remaining questions, um, spin it around a little bit, polish it up in a certain way and come up with a question that's forward looking. So we talked about a, um, a post US um, Middle East, a post US Gulf and the impact that that may have on, on Iran. But um, Eddie has asked the question about China and Chinese involvement in the Gulf. And Francesco has asked the question about Russia. Um, I know that uh, that certain people in the audience, including Guy Burton, will be interested in India. Uh, so I wonder, with the two minutes remaining, if I can ask each each of you, the presenters uh, to take thirty seconds and just tell us a little bit about how Iran may see this future with regard to these new actors coming into the region. How will this evolving multipolarity? with regard to Russia, China, India, um, 
and, and any others that you may think of playing a, a more prominent role in, in the Gulf, how will that changing multipolarity, moving away from a, a US hegemony or, or indeed adding an extra layer of complexity to multipolarity, how will Iran respond to that? So if I can ask you to keep your answers within 30 seconds, then we can hear from all of you. Um, Olivia, we'll come to you first, please. I think uh, we've lost we it. That, uh, yeah, no, no. I think we, we said we are. I'm going to re reply this question if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, uh, I think this the, the multipolarity enters within the the, the pragmatic uh, approach that Iran is giving to the its foreign policy. So uh, having China, India, or other actors within the the, the Middle East is actually in line with the, the Iranian foreign policy objective of, of not relying on one external power, but having multilateral relations with uh, several powers that are interested in, in, in the region. The, the important thing for Iran is that China is not having any kind of political or conditionality uh, approach to the relations with any of the Middle East countries. So it, it, China is equally, uh, involved in the business with Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, and they really don't, get, I mean, maybe Guy and other people can, can give another perception, but what I say is that China is not asking for anything uh, in order to negotiate with Iran, nor Saudi, nor Qatar, the Chinese president, when they, they, they travel to the region, they visit the three countries at the same time. They are not getting involved in sectarian issues, political issues, they are not getting involved with um, opposition within the inside the countries they are not getting involved in internal affairs so this is the perfect approach that any gcc or uh, middle east states would like to to have with a country that is not interfering in the internal affairs the only thing they want is to do business and china so far proved to be a reliable actor i mean with the exception of the current situation in iran that uh, china is not doing what they they are expected to in terms of buying oil uh, and that would be um, 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, Shukru, yes. very quickly, please. Yes. And uh, if one day, uh, if China uh, come to the region uh, to challenge the uh, United States uh, uh, presence in the Middle East, I think it is very, very good. Uh, it will be very good development for uh, Iran because uh, when we look at it, just uh, I am uh, I, as I uh, focus on the oil issue, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, and uh, China, uh, Iranians, I Iran's uh, oil uh, uh, export, majority of Iranian oil export goes to China, like around thirty percent. So this creates a very suitable, uh, you know, uh, a climate for Iran to challenge the. Uh, uh, the U.S. hegemony in this system, but if uh, you know one day, uh, if one day in the future, if China comes to the region, but at the moment uh, I'm critically approaching, you know, critically uh, approaching this uh, issue uh, of okay. uh, declining U.S. hegemony in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Shukru. Okay, Gulriz, the floor is yours to end this discussion. 30 okay. seconds, please. Okay, thank you. As uh, discussed in my paper, actually, Iran wants to involve Russia and China more. Uh, this is uh, basically built on the idea that, you know, in order to balance the West, Iran needs uh, the, the East. So that, that was the essence of its look to the East policy. A quick answer to Francesco's question, Israel is looking for Russia to check and balance Iran in Syria. That's why, you know, uh, there is an intrinsic Russia element in Syria, uh, uh, Israeli strikes on uh, Syria. And an interesting point I would like to end with this, um, you know, we talked about in the, uh, Russia, China, uh, Russia, China, uh, and on India, actually, there's an interesting dynamic. So the U.S. actually lets Iran-India uh, cooperation in order uh, for Afghanistan to benefit from it. So this Chabahar port issue is, I think, very critical. So that that seems to be a different pattern going on there. But obviously, Iran's understanding of multipolarity involves Russia and China so long as they stand with Iran to balance the United States. So that would be my uh, quick response. 
thank you for the panel. By the way. Fantastic. Right. All that remains to be said is to say thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thank you everyone for coming along and listening for the questions. Uh, I must also then just point out that in 26 minutes we have our next panel, Norms, Democratization and Multipolarity in a Global Middle East, chaired by Francesco Belcastro. So do come along if you can. And once again, thank you very much, attendees, participants, speakers. Thank you. Thank you.